These shelters are those Farm Tech grab bag tarps. They're $22. These have been out in the winter for eight years. Wow. I mean, they hold up super well. Hi folks, welcome back. So in the first video, we covered the brooding of the chicks and the feeding and watering of the chickens. In the second video, we're gonna cover the pasturing of the chickens, basically building chicken tractors, moving those tractors around the pasture and using electric poultry knitting to discourage predators. Dave uses very lightweight, easy to move chicken tractors. We'll show you how this chicken tractor is built, plus some tips on how to use the electric poultry netting, and then some tips on how to move the chickens around the pasture, including mixing species. And finally, Dave will discuss when is the best time of the year to grow these chickens. These shelters, I've had a couple versions before. This is my latest. I've done the Quonset Huddy ones, which were fine. Mm -hmm. these, these shelters are those Farm Tech grab bag tarps. They're $22. Uh -huh. 12 by 12. These have been out in the winter. I just dragged these out back for eight years. Wow. I mean, they hold up super well. And they're toughened on the on the edges. They got yeah, and I yeah, and I just I even bought a couple bags of their little bungee things. Yep. Super lightweight frame. I mean, this whole thing pulls right off, so when you can get in right there easily, if you want to get in there. Mm -hmm. You can see the waterer. It's like a 10-foot piece of PVC, whatever I had laying around. Some mm -hmm. some I think I got four-inch pipe. Obviously, more volume. This was just old trampoline safety net. Nice. It's all this all lightweight pine. Yep. You know, this is not a heavy, it's not yeah. a heavy shelter. Yeah, I built ours out of cedar. It's because yep. I had it, you know, and the thing from the that, sawmill. That, um, exactly, same with my sawmill. Uh, what I, what the game changer for me too was that mentality of, you know, the first ones I built were like little mini Fort Knoxes, mm -hmm. which of course makes them heavier. But with the electric van, I don't have to worry about that. Right. And, and the thing is, anything you get in there, they'll get underneath. You know, if they get through this, so what was the point? So just keep them super lightweight. That way, when you're pulling, if you do pin a bird, you're not going to crush the bird. Right. You know, that taking that time to. And what's nice, you can sit here. You know, you're looking back at the bird, and you can just see what they're doing. Right. And you have these on skis. Yeah. You and know, you got a little I've, bit of I is have that rubber. Like Salatin. He's like a wheel thing that goes underneath and picks the back up. Mm -hmm. And two people move them, and I think yeah, you can go and prop it up, and one person can pull from the front. But what I just found was, with the skis in particular, this is a little bit odd of a lot. They've been pulling uphill, yeah, but these just pull pretty easy. So, but that's a manageable size. It pulls easily, uh, and part of it would depend on your land. If it's all, if you had really lumpy, rocky land, you probably want a smaller shelter because you don't want gaps that they can hop out of. And you might yeah. notice I had little rubber. Printers mats, yeah, but you know, roofing, uh, carpet, yeah, whatever. I think those were printers mats or what I because I have a buddy that worked at a printing shop. Everybody asks how many birds per tractor. Well, a good rule of thumb is two square feet per bird if you're doing broilers and you're keeping them inside the tractor. So, an eight foot by 12 foot tractor that's 96 square feet, that's 48 broilers. Dave's tractors are 10 feet by 13 feet, so that's 130 square feet, so that's about 65 broilers. But Dave tends to run about 50 birds in each tractor because he likes to give them a little more room. Salatin says that 1.3 to 2.4 square feet per bird is the sweet spot. The second thing you'll need is a place to pasture the birds. Dave moves his tractors every day. He only passes his birds over the pasture once each year and allows the ground to rest over the winter. He runs a 10 foot by 13 foot tractor with 50 birds in each tractor. With 50 birds in each tractor, you will want to move them every day. If you're only raising 25 birds in a similar sized tractor, you might be able to move them every other day. Just watch how trampled and pooped on the pasture is and judge for yourself if you should move them. Dave's broilers spend three weeks in the brooder and four weeks on pasture. Four weeks with a new spot every day means 28 spots for that tractor. So if a tractor is 10 foot by 13 foot, that's 130 square feet. 130 square feet times 28 days is 3,640 square feet. One acre is 43,560 square feet. So 3,650 square feet is about one twelfth of an acre. 
So 50 birds on a twelfth of an acre means that on an entire acre you could raise about 600 birds if you were moving them every day. Dave uses netting from Premier Poultry. He says if you're planning on keeping the birds in the tractors and not letting them roam free within the netting, then he prefers the 42 inch tall nets with the single spike base since they're easier to set up and move. If you plan on letting the birds roam free within the netting, or if you have high predator pressure from coyotes or domestic dogs, then you should probably go with the 48 inch high netting with the two spike base since they hold the netting more securely. You will need an energizer and a ground rod to electrify the netting. There are three basic types of energizers. Here's what Dave has to say about those. Oh, you're running off 110. Well, we're close enough to the barn that running an extension cord isn't bad. What I have found, we get those solar chargers, but they're really expensive. Yeah. The car battery runs are like 50, 60 bucks, and an RV battery will power it for two weeks anyways. Oh, so okay. I just swap out batteries when I was more remote. Um, this was close enough, and this was sitting around. This Now, one thing I do do, I, I didn't do it this year on this, but in the past, wrap tin foil every 10 feet or so and smear paint, peanut butter. I've heard people mm -hmm. use bacon. But the idea is like a bear can easily walk through this, but yep. if they sniff that first and, you, and they get a jolt, they, yep. they, they steer clear. Uh, I've been fortunate, there's a lot of bear in the area, there's a lot of fox in the area, there's coyote in the area. Um, knock on wood this this really did change uh, you know uh like well, i remember a few years ago just the moving of the shelters every day confuses them so that's a pretty good thing i'm down by the road that might help mm -hmm. um, but by doing this it really just virtually eliminated all predators and you're moving how deep of a ground rod are you putting in there it's just basically body weight okay uh, well, obviously isn't that deep, so. oh wow um, you know, and I had it down kind of to a science. You'd move that every nine moves if you started the charger up there. Uh huh. And you'd, you'd move the net like every other day type thing. But you could, you know, because when these, you could see where they were, obviously. Right. You know, uh, and so you, you don't have to move that near as much as you think about it. Kind of get the system. So you, as you move them, you're turning the fence so that the charger doesn't have to move? Plan. I mean, it's not too hard to move it, but you just don't. If you think about it, you you can move that once a week versus every day. But what's nice too, you look after. Is there blood in the stool? You can kind of tell about the health of the bird. This, these mm -hmm. look pretty good. Uh, well, what's nice and you know what it does to the, the field. The ideal thing would be run goats or something else beef, after beef. Now, actually, before because then they chew it down because. There's no problem running chickens in long grass, but they just get dirty, you know, uh -huh. they're just dirty. Um, I'd rather run the uh, beef first. Uh -huh. and I guess what Salton does, he waits three days, and then you run the chickens, because then the chickens will, flies have landed in the, in Cow the patties. manure. But the advantage of the chickens going in is then it spreads the manure around too, the cow manure. They, they like the food, but it spreads around. Like if you look at a field that's been overgrazed by cow, you got, you know, basically chewed into nothing but this tall weed, tall weed, tall weed. Well, everywhere that is is where the cow patty landed. Uh, so if you get the chickens to spread it out, the chickens do the work, and you get, but you, you, you could stack your rotation. You could beef out this field and chicken. Right. So you get more production. So when do you start doing beef? <laughs> I can't believe that these ones are just seven weeks old. Yeah. Yeah. Because they look uh, as big or a little bit bigger than the ones that we do earlier in the year, and they're only nine weeks old. Well, part of it, too, is that's the only reason why I wait till June 1st. It's more optimal growing conditions. I mean, mm -hmm. if they're shivering because they're cold, they're not going to, you know, they're not putting on weight. That into weight. So, you know, you want the best weather yep. that you can get. Now, that might be regionally different for me. You know, June first. Anytime I tried to push that, you know, because if they get wet, you know, the, the yeah. For us, it would probably be like August and September. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. It would be the warmest, and the and you know, usually our rains stop by July fourth. Yeah, so that's what I, you know, you want them on the pasture and the, and the best growing periods. The same like doing like turkeys. You know, I used to do it so you do the turkeys, so I'd harvest them the day of uh, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. 
and I'd kind of go, I'd raise them 16 weeks, you know, because the mm -hmm. hens would be 15 pounds, the toms would be 20 pounds. That's what everybody wants, a 15, 20 pound bird. Mm -hmm. And you could get them, pick them up fresh Sunday before Thanksgiving, leave them in the fridge. And then Never them. frozen. Never frozen. And that, you know, that worked. But some, you know, Salatons, like, just raise them in the summer when it's ideal. <laughs> freeze know. them. Then you got to freeze them and then maybe you got some people to buy them early. Yeah. But people don't want to fill the freezer up with a turkey. Yeah, big turkey. Yeah. There are lots of pastured poultry chicken tractor designs out there. Some are better for layers. Some are better for meat birds. You'll hear them called various names. Salatin style. Perkins style, Suskovich style, cattle panel style, A-frame style, etc. Most of these designs are either built low profile but heavy enough that they need to be moved by one or two people with a custom two-wheel dolly, or they're built tall and light enough that they can blow over in strong winds, or they're built both tall and heavy and need wheels or need to be pulled by a vehicle like a quad or a gator or a farm tractor to move them. The gable style tractor that Dave and I used is designed to be very lightweight so it can be moved by hand with no additional tools. However, it's also low profile enough that it doesn't catch the wind like the taller Suskovich and cattle panel style designs. Instead of using corrugated sheet metal for the roof, this design uses a rugged tarp for the roof. The key to building these tractors is the tarps. You want to select a quality tarp that will last for many years. Do yourself a big favor and buy a quality light colored tarp. They don't cost that much more than the crappy tarps, but they're a much better value in the long run. This tractor is intentionally designed to be inexpensive and easy to build, but also robust enough to last for many years. And we have mounted thrift shop skis or slippery plastic on the bottom boards so these tractors slide and move easily. Dave and I both own sawmills, so the wood that we use is wood that we milled ourselves from what we have available. Dave's in New Hampshire, so he uses pine. I'm in Washington State, so I use Western Red Cedar. But you could buy similar lumber at any decent lumber yard and build these tractors entirely out of store-bought wood. Here's a CAD drawing of the tractor. I drew this CAD drawing just for this video to make it easier to visualize the framework on screen. I never used a drawing while building these tractors. They're so simple, it's not necessary. This is an eight foot by 12 foot version, though you could size this to whatever size tarp you happen to acquire. The peak on this eight foot by 12 foot one is 54 inches tall, so four and a half feet. And the roof tarp extends all the way to the boards on both sides, so this design doesn't catch the wind like other designs do. The tarp roof is removable though, so when you need to get inside to adjust something, you can just fold back part of the roof and reach right in or step inside. Because the roof comes right off, you don't have to get on your knees to catch the birds once harvest day comes, which is one of the major complaints with the Salatin style tractor. The gable ends on this tractor are mesh. You can use hardware cloth or chicken wire. In Dave's case, he used recycled trampoline safety netting. You can use deer netting. The mesh combined with the height of this tractor allow you to see the birds as you're pulling the tractor by hand, which makes it much less likely for you to pinch a bird because you can see what's happening. The bottom boards and the ridge board are what the lumber stores call five quarter by six inch deck boards. They actually measure one inch by five and a half inches. The rafters are what the lumber stores call one by fours, but they're actually five-eighths of an inch by three and a half inches. You'll find links to lumber like this in the description. I use short pieces of two by twos as nailers in the corners, and I put plywood braces at each of the bottom corners, plus plywood gusset plates at the rafter peaks at each end. These braces and gussets really help to strengthen the frame. I wanted to emphasize that this is a, a scalable method. You can start with 25 birds. You don't have to have 150 birds, but you could do, you know, 50 in one of these tractors that Dave shows. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, it's a low, pretty low input method. What we have tended to do here is buy our birds at the same time as some friends with, with their farms and homesteads and then bring them all back um, when they're ready to slaughter. So we have one slaughter day and a bunch of us get together and slaughter. So Dave in New Hampshire buys his birds from Mount Healthy Hatchery in Ohio. Here in the Pacific Northwest we've been buying from Jenks Hatchery. Um, they have free shipping. Uh, I've been really happy with their Red Ranger birds the past couple of years. Um, they're a totally different thing than the Cornish Cross. I mean the Red Rangers will take almost twice as long to finish. Um, to get to that uh, four to five pound size. So um, it's a different thing. But if you want to do this and make money, um, I would follow the methods that Dave sh shows here. If you'd like to see any other videos uh, specifically 
you know, or have any specific questions on feed or anything like that or economics of it, uh, I can do a video uh, with spreadsheet and show you, you know, the actual numbers uh, worked out. Yeah. So if you like it, please like and subscribe. And uh, if you have any questions, comment below and uh, I'll get back to you on it. Thank you.